in the 2008 campaign, a bald man, rather heavy set, who worked as a plumber and was interested in starting his business, uh, had a conversation with uh, then Senator Barack Obama with regard to the taxes that he would be facing should he begin his own business. He had worked for a number of years as a plumber and worked very hard to save and invest, and now he was prepared to set out on his own and start his own business. As he looked at the President's plan for taxation, he saw that it would be very possible that with uh, the start of his business, he would be exposed to a higher tax rate than what he had previously. So he was concerned about it. He asked uh, Mr. Uh, Obama with regard to his point of view. And in the course of his explanation, uh, the President, or then uh, the soon, to be, soon to be President, uh, indicated that it was his perception that he wanted to give tax relief to those who were in uh, the lower uh, part of our economy, the middle income folks, those earning under $250,000. And when they uh, came to the point where they were making above that, then they would pay a little bit extra, uh, perhaps to help those who were still at the bottom level to find a way into the workforce and find a way uh, towards prosperity. In the course of his conversation, he said that he, would, he was interested in seeing that the wealth be spread around to others. This caught the attention of uh, John McCain, the opposing candidate at the time, and uh, for many conservatives, it seemed to be a slip of the tongue which revealed something of the president's mindset, his economic philosophy, a philosophy of wealth redistribution, of spreading the wealth around to others of taking it from some and extending it to uh, others, indeed. Many... <laughs> For those who didn't see that, my trombone just moved. <laughs> <clears throat> Many uh, took great uh, offense at this kind of description, but Truly, it's been a part of our American uh, tax system for uh, generations now. There's been a progressive tax uh, where those who are wealthier pay more into the system and those who earn less pay less into the system. And there would be a debate as to where those margins would be. Uh, the President has said it should go back to the time of Bill Clinton, a time when there was, in, in his mind, greater prosperity. Uh, and, and so there, that is the argument. Of course, behind it all is an interest to care for the poor and the needy. How do we best help those who uh, are disadvantaged for whatever reason, whether it be in economic circumstances, uh, through uh, physical handicaps, uh, through other kinds of uh, disadvantages, lack of education, and so forth, lack of opportunity? How do we help those who are in the poor uh, areas of life rise up to share in the prosperity and abundance of our country. What is the most appropriate way to do this? Uh, President Bill Clinton spoke quite often in glowing words of shared prosperity, and doesn't that sound nice? We spread the wealth around so that everyone can take part in the blessings of the country. All this is part of a broader uh, concept called social justice that has been at work in our country for many years, uh, beginning with the Humanist Manifesto and signed uh, particularly by John Dewey and his emphasis on bringing a kind of social justice to our nation through the public school system and educating our young people to see uh, the world differently than what they have before. Uh, on through William Ayers and his efforts to promote a social justice uh, agenda, not only in politics, but also again in education. <clears throat> what is social justice? Well, briefly it is wealth redistribution, but it goes beyond that, and our sermon this morning will not uh, attempt to address all the many issues that social justice presents. Quite often it talks about racism and the impact of um, different points of view on subjecting unfavored races. And so political economic structures are placed on particular groups of people because of their race to keep them down. 
There's sexism that is considered in social justice theory, uh, the, the way that uh, uh, women in particular are oppressed and, and, and subjected to economic hardship, all kinds of injustices found in uh, our American society. Particularly as we have uh, prospered and, and, and flourished in the world today, it is considered that we have been unjust in the way, way that we have treated other nations and kept them impoverished as we have, uh, if you will, raped their natural resources, take, stripped them of their ability so that we would be enriched by them. Social justice, therefore, is a, a point of view which advocates a correction to these perceived abuses. Of course, the concept of justice really is not well defined in this. Who's justice? It is something of a rhetorical ploy to say that I am acting on behalf of justice, social justice. And therefore, any opposition to what I perceive to be just is unjust. Any attempt to side with those who are wealthy, those who possess property, protect their property rights, is a form of racism and uh, injustice. How do you argue with somebody who says that you're being unjust? Well, perhaps part of the argument needs to be a discussion of what exactly justice is. Do we determine on our own what is justice? What is the right thing to do? And then do we enforce that with government systems, such as a tax system, an economic system that redistributes forcibly the wealth from those who are productive to those who are in need? What is the proper way to minister to the poor? In the text that we read a moment ago from the Gospel of Mark, uh, incidentally, that this story is told also in the Gospels of Matthew and John. John gives the most uh, uh, complete account, and in some respects he puts it in a little bit of a different setting, emphasizing the context of resurrection, whereas in Mark's Gospel it uh, focuses more on the context of hum Christ's humility, his manhood, and his approaching death and burial. But the stories at heart are the same. Jesus is invited to the home of Simon the leper. Uh, presumably someone who had been healed of his leprosy and wanted to honor Jesus uh, for, what is, for his ministry. Uh, in particular, it takes place in the town of Bethany. And so it's an opportunity to honor Jesus for his mighty work that was seen and evident by all of raising Lazarus from the dead. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus would be a part of this uh, little party. And Jesus and his disciples would be gathered there, and no doubt others also were watching, or at least perhaps even a part of this uh, gathering. So in the midst of this uh, uh, celebration, this uh, dinner in honor of Jesus and his work of mercy in raising Lazarus from the dead, Mary, Lazarus' sister, and the sister of Martha, who knew that was busy and involved in all the preparations for the meal, Mary expresses her thanksgiving to Christ and her devotion to Him by taking a bottle of perfume, expensive perfume. In fact, some estimate that it is a, a year's salary's worth of perfume. So if today the average wage is thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, that would be the cost of this bottle of perfume, very, very expensive perfume. She breaks the bottle and then pours it out in full all over the body of Jesus, from his head, over his hair, his body, down to his very feet. And then she wipes his feet dry with her own hair. Weeping in the course of all this, rejoicing in the mercies of the Lord and showing her great devotion and affection to Him. What a wonderful display of love and affection for Christ the Savior. Thanksgiving to Him for saving her brother from death, rescuing him, and proclaiming the resurrection from the dead through this great mighty work. 
Some of those were not very happy with what she did. Uh, John does not, or excuse me, Mark does not identify it at the first. You can imply it. He makes it more general, but John's Gospel specifies that Judas Iscariot, in particular, who was the treasurer of the disciples, who understood the cost of things, uh, was calculating in his mind the cost of this very expensive perfume. And very quickly he recognized that this perfume would come to a year's wages. What a waste, he thought. What a sinful extravagance to pour it out upon Jesus in this fashion. So uh, uh, profligate was the way that she poured this perfume out. And so he and perhaps others of the disciples as well grumbled and said, why wasn't this perfume sold in the marketplace and the proceeds given to the poor? Wouldn't that be a charitable thing to do? To give this perfume over to Judas and his fellows that they might distribute the proceeds to the poor and minister to their needs. I think it's John that notes that Judas himself really wasn't concerned about the poor. He used to pilfer uh, from the treasury some of the monies in it and keep it for himself. And so he was the middleman who uh, profited from all the little charitable contributions and he made a little business for himself out of it. Not entirely known to all, but perhaps John himself knew of his, his activities. And so Judas puts on this facade of care and concern for the poor when he sees the extravagant devotion of Mary before Jesus. And he raises a fuss and they rebuke the woman harshly for what she had done. What is Jesus' response? He doesn't join in with their criticism. Now, Jesus was one who had shown his compassion for the poor Many, many times in the course of his ministry, he called upon a rich young man to sell all his possessions and give them to the poor and to follow after Christ. Uh, he himself fed the multitude, fed thousands with few loaves of bread and some small fish. Multiple times he did that. Jesus uh, healed the sick and the lame and raised them up. Providing blessing after blessing upon them. Jesus cared for the poor. He preached the gospel to the poor. He rebuked the wealthy and the powerful. Jesus was one who was well known for his compassion for the poor. If any today talk about caring for the poor, they no doubt would point to Jesus as one who ministered to the needs of the poor. And we should follow his example, they would say. But what does Jesus say at this time? It's almost as though he said something that a, a political uh, cartoonist would take and put into a soundbite and use against him. The poor you have with you always. It sounds so cavalier, so uncaring. You've got the poor, you can care for them anytime you want to. I can just imagine in a political campaign somebody taking that and putting it into a commercial and advertising, Jesus hates the poor, he's for the rich. He has no compassion. He's the rich, the one of the one percent. He has no care for the poor, right? But what Jesus does here is, is slightly rebuke the disciples and, and those who criticize him by saying, you can help the poor anytime you want to. <laughs> Ask, really pointing out that are you really interested in helping the poor? Have you really done all that you should to help the poor? Your great concern for the poor really impresses me, but <laughs> truly, what have you personally done to help the poor? But Jesus reminds us that sometimes in life there are greater priorities. And you have to keep the ministry to the poor in context of the greater demands of the kingdom. And particularly at this moment in time, Jesus, in his special earthly ministry, at this moment when he's about to be crucified, 
was uh, rightly uh, worshipped and served in this way by this extravagant gift. In fact, we should give all that we have to Jesus for what he would do for us at the cross. This extravagant gift was the least that should be done for Jesus. And Jesus notes what she has done, and she said, he says that she has done all that she could. She gave out of her own resources according to her own abilities. Martha served in another way, caring for the meal and getting all the guests cared for, making sure the meal was uh, delicious and so forth. Martha served in the way that she could serve. Mary did her part. She could do what Martha could do, but she did what she could do. Christ recognizes the many different ways in which we care for Him, whether it be in expensive ways or in ways of service. Christ receives them all and recognizes them. But Jesus commended Mary for this act of devotion to Him. And so it reminds us that our service for the poor needs to be given in the context of service for Christ. He should be uppermost. I find this important in that when you look at general giving of, of different political parties in particular, and you know who gave what to charitable uh, events, charitable causes, typically you find that those who are of conservative bent give more of their charitable income to churches or other charities, and so a greater portion of their income goes towards charities then you find those who are on the progressive left, who consider that the government is the one that provides for charity. So they themselves don't, don't so much give to charitable causes. You look at the pres presidential candidates and compare their charitable contributions over the course of their uh, ministries, the course, course of their stewardship. Who gave more to charitable causes? You can look that up for yourself. I won't give away the answer. But Jesus commends that giving that gives first to Him, to the work of His kingdom, the advance of His cause. That takes priority. And then we have care and concern for the poor. And we should give to them, we should minister to them. Jesus' comment that you have the poor with you always reminds us that there will always be a need to minister to those who are poor. There will always be among us, those who are struggling, impoverished, dealing with all kinds of setbacks in life, and Christian compassion should be concerned for them. There is a priority in the way that we should address the needs of the poor. The Apostle Paul says that we should care for uh, those who are of the household of faith, first of all. He says we should provide for our families first, prior, even before the household of faith, we should care for our own families. If we fail to care for our family members, then we deny the faith, in Paul's words. So charity begins at home. You should take care of your children, your grandchildren, and others who are closely connected to you to be sure that they are provided for. That's why the family is so important for a country. The family is the place where charity begins. And when the family is broken up, when the family is uh, encouraged to separate because the government will provide a variety of social services, then that network of support collapses. Families should take care of one another. We should, as members of the Christian church, be especially concerned for those who are believers in Christ. Remember when Jesus told that parable of uh, the sheep and the goats gathering before him on the right side and the left hand side. And the, the sheep uh, come before him and, and uh, Jesus welcomes them because of what they had done for the poor. You fed the poor, you visited them when they were in prison. And they said, when did we do this for you? Jesus said, when you did, it, you did it for me, when you cared for my poor. When you showed compassion for my people, you did it for me. Whereas those who were the goats would be rejected because they failed to provide for the people of God. 
So those who fail to contribute to the church, to its benevolence ministries, to the care for the poor, to Christian people especially, need to consider what their destiny will be when they appear before this judge. What have you done to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and keep His kingdom uppermost in your mind? But we are to do good not only to the house of God, but to all men as we have that opportunity. We are to care for all men and nations and to provide opportunities to minister to them and their needs. What are the best ways in which we can do that? Well, is it by the government taking the wealth from some and distributing it to others? Or is there a better way? Developing an economy where jobs are provided so that people can provide for themselves. Clearly, the emphasis needs to be there. Enabling entrepreneurs, business people to provide jobs so that people can work and earn a living for themselves and provide for their families, for themselves, for their church, and for the poor. Uh, the Apostle Paul, in advising those who were stealing, told them that they should steal no more, but uh, work with their own hands so that they might provide for their own needs and for the needs of others. This is what God calls us to do, to work and to provide for others. But then secondly, as Jesus said to the disciples around him, you can help the poor whenever you want to. You should freely give of what you have to help others. So there should be private enterprises to minister to the poor and the needy and so forth. Churches should give for the poor. Individuals and families should give to the poor. There should be a wide range of benefits to support the poor. By doing this charitably, rather than the government forcing you to do that by taxation, first you encourage true compassion and love, rather than resentment. When the government takes your money from you, and gives it to somebody you don't know, that breeds resentment, that breeds an attempt to hold that which you have, to hide it, and not to give to others when the time comes. But freely giving to people provides personal care, stewardship, and, and, and provision. We learned uh, this past week that welfare spending in the United States tops this year one trillion dollars. One trillion dollars is being spent on welfare. And that's not enough, we're told. <laughs> More needs to be spent. When you look at welfare over the past uh, generation or two, the more you spend, the more you're going to need to spend. And what is more, back in the 80s, I think it was Thomas Sowell made the point that uh, of all the contributions that are made to government to care for the poor and needy, only about a third of those contributions actually make it to the poor. Two-thirds are being siphoned off by government bureaucrats. All those who are in the government system are profiting from this business. What are the most wealthiest communities in the country? But those right around Washington, D.C., where all the government bureaucrats live. They prosper from this business. You think of foreign countries where foreign aid goes into different countries and they talk about all the poor and caring for the poor. The money goes into these countries doesn't actually get to the poor. A lot of it ends up in the hands of the, the leader or his political favorite people and never really reaches the poor. Government is notoriously wasteful, inefficient, in providing for people. If you were to give people that trillion dollars of charity just in handouts, probably you'd be making a whole lot more than what you do from the government dole. The proper way, the best way, is to produce a thriving economy where people have all kinds of jobs offered to them so that employers have to compete for labor and pay people more because they need their labor to provide jobs. And for those who are disadvantaged, those who are handicapped, sick, unable to help, then a wide variety of charitable ways could be provided for them. Families should provide for them. The church should provide for them. 
And if need be, some would suggest that even government, some government help could be provided as well in the extreme. In any case, the emphasis needs to be on following Christ and exalting Him. Christ needs to be the Lord of all these things. And He provides a way to care for those who are in need. <coughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we thank You for Christ who sets us free. We thank You for Jesus who was rich, yet uh, for our sakes became poor, so that we, through His poverty, might be made rich. We thank You for the salvation that we have in Him. The, for the way that he's delivered us from the debt of our sins and made us rich with his righteousness. We pray that your spirit would bless us with a generous heart, that we would love the poor, care for them, minister to their needs, that you would be exalted in this as we work for uh, their uh, deliverance from hardship and oppression. We ask it in Jesus' name.